Well, thank you very much, uh, uh, Trevor. Uh, it's a privilege to be here uh, to talk to fellow Zimbabweans and also our brothers and sisters from the neighboring countries. The theme of this uh, conference uh, centers around the African narrative, the issue of the African Renaissance. How do we build a strong, sustainable Africa? How do we build a strong, sustainable uh, Zimbabwe? Uh, and why is it that um, uh, six decades after independence, much of Africa uh, still lags behind uh, the global uh, community, the global uh, you know, you know, you know, standards? Uh, you referred to uh, Robinson and Asemoglu's uh, seminal book uh, on why nations uh, uh, fail. I, I think the starting point must be uh, leadership, uh, strong leadership, uh, uh, strong leadership with a with a with a strategy, strong leadership uh, with a with a with a with a vision. But this leadership is generated somewhere. Uh, it's generated by the citizens. It's generated through an electoral delivery system that can actually uh, deliver. And sadly, on the African continent, the issue of, uh, the issue of challenged elections uh, becomes central uh, to the production uh, of um, a certain uh, type of uh, leadership. We also need strong institutions, a strong parliaments, a strong civic society, the rule of law, uh, and all these things. The issue uh, of a common vision is key. The issue of uh, a vision is, 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 is key. The issue of accountability uh, is, 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 is key. I was looking at some of the frightening statistics uh, on the African uh, uh, you know, you know, continent. Uh, at independence in the 50s, in the 60s, uh, our per capita income was around 1,200. Six decades later, the average per capita income in Africa is 1,500. Zimbabwe, by the way, is around 1,200. Why is it that we still have uh, these conflicts? In the past two years alone, we have had about uh, six schools, particularly in the Sayo area. Uh, coups in, in Mali, uh, uh, in Burkina Faso, uh, uh, in the Central African Republic, in Niger, in Chad, and, and, and so forth. We have unstable states, and part of the reason why we have unstable states is because this, the state, uh, to many others, is an arena of, of personal accumulation. The state, to many people, is an arena of the reproduction of the tribe, uh, the family, the state, and, and I come to, 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 to the issue around uh, Manize, which uh, uh, Chris uh, uh, spoke about. It's important to have strong institutions. It's important to have strong, uh, you, know, you, know, you, know, you, know, you know, legislation. We have a public procurement uh, act that demands that whatever we do must go to uh, tender, whether it's construction of roads, construction of airports, and so forth. In Africa, Many of those laws are made more in breach than in a, 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 you know, you know, you know, compliance. There's nothing with, uh, wrong with investment. We actually need uh, in investment. But investment must go through our country's uh, you know, due process. Uh, Manize is sitting, and I think many of you actually don't know that we actually have one of the world's biggest uh, uh, resources, uh, one of the biggest uh, uh, deposits of iron ore about 40 billion metric tons of, uh, of, of iron ore. Uh, a few years ago, an Indian company called ESA actually came into Zimbabwe and actually invested uh, in Zimbabwe. But it pulled out of Zimbabwe because it was not allowed to have access. So it was given the infrastructure at Zisco still, but it was not allowed to have access to the, uh, to the, to the iron ore. So many Zimbabweans do not know how, for instance, who actually is constructing it at it, it, it Manize. I first learned it uh, today. What is the connection between the company that is constructing there and the 40 billion uh, uh, metric tons of iron ore that is actually there? Uh, did, this, did this contract, was this contract actually subjected to, uh, you know, to, 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 to tender? These are questions that uh, uh, need to, uh, to be answered. But speaking generically, I think to build a, a sustainable state, as I've said, it's so important to respect uh, constitutions. 
and to have constitutions with constitutionalism. It's so important to have the rule of law. It's so important to have uh, elections that actually uh, uh, deliver. It's so important to carry everyone on board. It's so important to have a, a, you know, a, a common vision. It's so important to have strong institutions, particularly a strong independent uh, uh, you know, you know, you know, you know, judiciary. Anything else renders us sustainable to wars, sustainable to coups, sustainable to fragility, sustainable to vulnerability. And regrettably, that is the balance sheet of Africa in the last 60 years. Um, Chris, I see my brother Chris is shaking uh, his head. Chris, you will have an opportunity to respond to the issues that uh, uh, that Tendai has said. I thought, in fairness, you will respond, Chris. Um, will respond to. I'm 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 very even-handed. There's no rigging here. So, uh, <laughs> um, Nigel, you've had the conversation uh, taking place already, uh, which raises issues of uh, national resources, transparency, and accountability the importance of a strong state, of strong institutions all across. You know, the, the book that, um, uh, um, that, that uh, um, Tendai refers to, for instance, says, uh, and I'll quote, we need a state that is capacity to enforce laws, control violence, resolve conflicts, and provide public services, but still be tamed and controlled by an assertive and well-organized society. My question to you is, do we have an assertive and well-organized society to push against some of the issues that uh, Chris has already raised, some of the issues that Tendai is already questioning that uh, Chris uh, has put on the table to us? Do you want to engage with that issue? Sure, Trevor, and uh, good morning uh, to all the viewers and all who are here present. Minister and uh, my brother Tendai, I think we must realize, Trevor, that uh, we are in a globally competitive environment where at this particular point in time, uh, liquidity in global capital markets is scarce. And that scarcity speaks around the wars we've seen and the war that's evolving. You know, global inflation is up, liquidity is, is very tight. And so you want, as a nation, to put your best foot forward so that you can attract global capital. We, as a nation, have a very, very low, if not negligible, savings base in terms of domestic savings. Uh, that is the formal indicators, of course. Uh, I think uh, never gave figures uh, earlier on or you know, around 2.6 billion. And then in the informal markets, probably about 7.5 billion uh, banked at National Mattress Bank, which I think is a great pity uh, as a nation because we should really be utilizing those savings in the formal financial markets so that we can actually complement any activity that is coming through that uh, private capital that the minister had made, has made reference to. And his commendations, I think if you can attract, you know, the ilk of uh, the investors that we've seen, uh, that's great. And, you know, my quest would be to have that scale of investment across the board and not just in a specific sector. And that gives us, I think it puts us at a disadvantage somehow given the wealth of resources that we have. And when I say resources, I want to put the manpower there in terms of capacity that we have. And we are in that boxing ring globally, competing with over 200 nations. If we look at Sub-Saharan Africa with the 45 nations that are there, the question is, and as a former ZIA chairman, having entertained a lot of these investors, they want to see that stability in terms of macroeconomic stability. And so if we can have that, then we can have global capital complementing domestic capital. And participation 
on the part of local investors, the CEOs that we see here, uh, Trevor, my fright is are we capable of competing in the African continental free trade area and punching within our weight? And sadly, I would tell you, no. The bulk of our businesses as they stand, unless they actually wake up and start stop overpricing and become more competitive, look for technologies, look for capital if we can, and have stable macroeconomic, uh, a macroeconomic environment, we are going to be flooded potentially with more competitive companies, more agile companies, companies and local and government itself. For example, if you look at procurement, are we procuring at competitive prices so that we can actually go out and export? And that's where my worry is. And are we attracting international capital to a large extent or to a comparatively acceptable level, you know, in line with what our neighbors are doing? Those then point to the areas of governance. And when we talk about governance, Trevor, I, I always, and I was here last week, I want to point out one specific issue the political risk premium that is attached to Zimbabwe renders us less competitive compared to other nations. And so our domestic players, in terms of being able to go out and punch within their weight category and have large production runs to be able to scale up and export just into the neighboring countries is where we are found wanting. Those would be my concerns. Thank you. Wow. Those are big, um, those are big issues, uh, um, uh, uh, Nigel. Uh, are we competitive CEOs? And I think you raise an issue which is hugely important, that sometimes we think that we're playing in the domestic market only. Um, and, and yet, for us to be able to be competitive, we need to uh, scale up on our talent, scale up on our technology, and realize that uh, the, our market is out there. Um, and you also raised the issue of uh, the political risk premium, which is, which is a huge thing. Um, Chris, two very big issues raised. You are shaking your head. By the way, you are not under inquisition. This is a debate. Uh, please uh, respond to the uh, issues that have, been, that have been raised. I prefer to stand up uh, because I, I own a... I, I, I started from the beginning by citing a company which is a global level company, which is the best in that particular business, even in America or wherever. What I wanted to jolt your minds about was to scale up in your mind. Because if you can't have scope and scale, then you continue to look in the rear review mirror where you are coming from, which is what Minister Beat is talking about. Whereas on my part, I'm looking through the windshield to say where are we going as Zimbabwe. And we are going straight ahead of everybody in the region, of everybody in Africa, in terms of the growth of this economy in the next three to four to five years. That picture in Indonesia which I showed you was Indonesia when it couldn't produce a ton of nickel, uh, in processed nickel in 2014. Today, Indonesia is the number one producer, is the number two producer of, of nickel, stainless steel nickel. That's why I cited you about steel spoons. Here's a country which was like Zimbabwe, which was rich in a certain resource, nickel, which has in, attracted world-class investment to be number two after China. We have 600, 700 kilometers of ferrochrome from Chamba to Gwanda. We are number two or number three in the whole world. We have the coal at Wange here, which is the best in the region, which, is, which, is, which, we are, which can produce coking coal. We have the limestone, and we have this deposit, which is talking about. All these things are there together. You can, anybody here who is being sold told to be a businessman, you have been here for years, those things were there. 
with your little money, which you think is big capital, you couldn't do anything to it. And even if you are as proud as anything, you can't do anything to it. Because capital which is required for a project of this nature is way beyond you. It's way beyond us. And every country has to go to the capital markets in the, in the world today, 93, 93 trillion US dollars of, market, of, cap, of capital on the global market. Only six trillion is available in the World Bank and the IMF, which my friend Bitt loves to quote about. The rest, 90, 90 trillion, is at Wall Street, at the Japan Stock Exchange in Tokyo, at the Stock Exchange in London. That's where you go and look for money to develop your country. And if you guys want to be anything in the future, don't listen to the Ray Review talk which is being talked said about here. <laughs> you talk about trying to get commensurate capital to marry to our resources, to marry to the best brains on the African continent, the most educated country on the African continent. That's what will make you rich, not being made to look at all these governance issues which are totally frivolous. They are metaphysics. <laughs> hey, this is metaphysics which is being talked about. You want to be rich, I'm telling you. I'm saying this because I have been the driver of this project. I know their implications on the national economy. I know all their implications on where Zimbabwe will be in terms of producing world-class goods. We will be producing power trains for electric vehicles from Manise in the next three years. Because where this company goes, Toyota goes, follows. Mercedes-Benz follows. Ford follows. This is what is going to happen at Manise. We have to have a new airport there. Steel merchants cannot come from Europe and then drive from Harare to Manise to buy steel. Because the steel which will be produced at Manise is the best. I showed you the border post which is coming up at Forbes border post in Mutare. That's massive. That's exporting four to five to 10 million tons of steel. And you are being told that you, you want to say we have capital. What capital do we have? We don't have that capital. I thank you. Um, you, you've, uh, you, you've really stirred the, uh, the honest nest. Um, uh, CEO's corporate governance is what? Frivolous. Um, perhaps not corporate governance, but good governance is frivolous. But, you know, the, 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 I, 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 you know, um, I believe in freedom of expression. That's what Chris believes. Uh, but... Nigel spoke about the political risk being high. And um, the issue was raised about the transparency and accountability regarding that. Is it a question of Chris not communicating well? Should your, this CEO here be hearing for the first time about the arrangement? Is it poor communication? And if it is poor communication, Chris, what does that say about inclusivity in decision making and implementation. Do you want to respond to that? And also on the political risk thing, because I think it's important too. Yeah. Part of it is real poor communication because what President Mnangagwa is doing with our resources is at a level which is commensurate to the, glo the global standard. The investors who are here, the guy who is doing steel and money is a billionaire, 10 over 60 something billion per annum, global. He manufactures steel for the Department of Defense in Philadelphia to make American submarines. They wanted to sanction Chinese companies. They couldn't because his technology is way ahead for the quality of American steel. He is in Indonesia. He is everywhere. So what w w w w the point I'm making is that the president has identified the resource base of Zimbabwe, and we are number four in diamonds. We are number three in ferrochrome. We are number two, we are number probably the top in Africa in, 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 in cooking coal. We are this. So he, measured, he looks at what God gave us. Then he says, who can make this be turned into riches? Then he goes and looks for companies which are capable. That's why he says Zimbabwe is open for business. People are not appreciating what the president is doing by bringing a world-class investor like this. And because all of us, we grew up in Rhodesia where we believe that, you know, small is big. When something like this happens, we have a wall, a firewall in our heads. 
We cannot see what is being done by the president so that you can properly adjust as a CEO to become rich because of the investment of this scale which is coming up. You are not adjusting. I want to tell you, I took a businessman, a very prominent businessman, he's my friend, to my knees. He thought he was big. By the time he left there, he was humbled. He says, ah, I didn't know that foreigners are coming to put such infrastructure in my country, world-class infrastructure. I'm telling you, there's a town of 60,000. I go to Old Mutual. I, I mention a name. You are building, you are investing in, in real estate. Can you build a town of 60,000 in anticipation of what's going, what's happening in Manisa? Because ne in the next two months, steel will be produced there. But Chris, uh, but, Chris. So I'm telling you that the issues, are, and this is risky capital. It's not government funds which go for tender with Comrade Lee. These guys who invest, they go to countries, this, if there's an offer from a particular country which entices him, he puts his money. You can't tender for risky capital. He looks at him with the, what you have and he takes his own risk. You tender for his money and you try to give him conditions and walk away. Then you end up with nothing. So it's called risky capital and all of you must understand what risky capital does. It looks for opportunity. Uh, then the last point you were saying... Political uh, risk. The political, political risk. risk yeah, I told you about the political risk which existed before in the First Republic. I was frustrated. I was there only for two months, for two years, for one year in that cabinet. I gave up. The political risk is to have a bunch of nitwits who are saying in cabinet, uh, who are in cabinet, who say we must stop exporting ferrochrome, I mean chrome ore to China until they build furnaces because they want to indigenize. What do you do? The guy says, I will not put in money in your country if you've got a gun on my head. I want to be free in your country to invest. Don't force me. So the Chinese abandoned the buying of ferrochrome from Zimbabwe. At the same time, they are building the biggest building construction ever in the history of humanity is going on in China. There is no ounce of Zimbabwe chrome in China, and you want to be prosperous. What does he do? The railway line collapses because it can't carry chrome. It can do, if it can't carry chrome, it can't carry wheat to be sustained. So the whole railway line from Shamba to, to, to Gwanda, all the way to Baira, collapsed because there was no load. Because in we were in cabinet saying indigenization, we want to have this. President has changed that. That's what is called changing political risk analysis to make capital come to this. And the same thing is happening in lithium. The best billionaires in the world are in Zimbabwe today. The top ones in the whole world. And what's going to happen in the next three to four years, we start producing batteries in Zimbabwe for the global market. And this ch capital has no color. Eh, don't say it's Chinese capital or it's American capital. Capital has no color. I just want to finish off by one thing which may not be uh, looked at. Currency risk. Everybody has got a, 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 a money in your pocket in U.S. dollars. If you look at your $100 notes, they are all crispy new. Do you realize? If you make a mistake one day, you brush your chin, it may burn you because it's coming straight from New York. It's still warm. Why, why is it? A, how? And then you look at the other notes which you have, the $10 notes, they are all crumbled and finished. Why? Because these were, came a long time ago, and they were coming from probably an allocation of the American government to Zimbabwe, and they've been wasted. The new ones which are coming, do you know where they are coming from? Six years ago, gold digging in Zimbabwe for SME was illegal. I was the chairman of the War Veterans at Mashingo. We made a resolution to say, why do we stop our young people from digging gold when the history of Zimbabwe is 800 years of gold digging? They were legalized because I went into cabinet. They were producing five tons 26 years ago. Today, they are producing 28 tons. They are producing gold. 1.6 young people, uh, 6 million, are digging gold. Some of them, they died because the industry is growing faster than they can be saved. But what does it do? What, do? what does it do? A plane leaves every night to Dubai. The notes leave the Federal Reserve System. I, I'm, I'm from finance in New York. That's my degree. It leaves, the notes leave New York. They go to Dubai. They meet our gold. The notes which are in your hand, 
They are earned by the people of Zimbabwe. They are not an allocation from the American government. The more we dig gold, because other countries get money by selling goods like we do, then you get hard currency. Zimbabwe is the advantage that we dig money because gold is everywhere. Thank Let you, Chris. young people dig gold. We have more money and we have a stable currency and we defeat inflation. For the first time, we went to an election without inflation because the president had stockpiled gold. And that made sure that the, the party which is on my left, they couldn't use inflation as a tool in urban areas. They lost their lower vote. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, the, 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 uh, the, uh, the, my... Um, I am going to read Colossians 6, 4 again. <laughs> Let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how you ought to answer each other. Um, Tendai, a lot of issues were raised, which you... Um, <laughs> Before I give the, the mic to, to, to Tendai, Tendai was uh, going to answer sitting down, but also <laughs> Sibuka um, Tendai, there's a number of things that the minister has said, and, and you do concede, minister, that uh, they, in terms of communication, there are, they are, they are issues. So if, if you could respond to that. But I hope you, you note, uh, uh, good friends, that the minister says he took a, a, one of the biggest businessmen to that place. This businessman didn't know that thing is happening. And I'm saying, Minister, can we communicate better? If you want these people to be part of what you're doing, these people ought to be, know what, what, is, what is happening, rather than to fly to Victoria Falls and be uh, breaking news from uh, Chris uh, <laughs> in Victoria Falls. Um, Tendai, if you could please uh, respond as, as much as you can. Uh, th thank you. I, I think the first thing that um, we have to be honest about is the toxicity of our politics and how this country is paying a price because of uh, the toxicity of that politics. We have had around 13 elections since uh, 1980. And if you measure the period that we've had elections, we've had an average, in every four years, we've had an, an election. And each one of those elections has been contested been disputed, including the just-ended harmonized election uh, on the 23rd of August uh, 2023. The report produced by the SADC Election Observer Mission on that election is the most damning condemnation of any election that you can see in, in recent uh, times. And that puts a premium uh, on our development that puts a premium on our attractiveness as an investment uh, destination. Most importantly, it underlines a, a, a discourse uh, of discohesion, a discourse of uh, disunity, a discourse of intolerance. The new parliament was only sworn in a week ago, but as already as I'm talking to you right now, that parliament has been weakened by unconstitutional recalls of over 15 or so members of parliament. So before we have begun, an important institution such as parliament has already been paralyzed. Local authority has already been paralyzed. So we're going to reproduce the lackadaisic status quo, the indifferent status quo, the conflict status quo of 2018 to 2023. We're going to reproduce it from 2023 to 2028 with the consequent rested development of Zimbabwe, slow growth rates, 3% growth rates, 2% growth rates, negative growth rates, where we could be having a sustained growth rate of at least 9% per annum. Where we, our GDP right now is around $18 uh, billion. Uh, uh, dollars. In 1980, Trevor, you are the economist, I'm not. In 1980, our GDP was a mere uh, $7 billion. Zambia was $3 billion. Kenya was uh, $7 billion. Fast track, 
uh, uh, 44 years after independence, Kenya is a $264 billion economy. Zimbabwe is an $18 billion economy. Zambia is now a $64 billion economy. What is the difference? The difference is leadership. What is the difference? The difference is our toxicity. So we need to confront the elephant in the living room, which is our ugly politics, our extractive uh, you know, you know, politics, our vicious politics, our predatory politics. We need to address that. Address the issue of resources. It is true that Zimbabwe is a rich country. We've got 63 uh, uh, minerals. And of those, four or five of them, we have got world-class deposits. World-class deposits in gold, world-class deposits in platinum, world-class deposits in, 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 in chrome, now world-class deposits in, 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 in lithium. But this country is not benefiting from these minerals. I said we've got 63. There's a country a few kilometers from here called Botswana. If you travel 90 kilometers to Kazungula border post, you are in, the, you are in Botswana. It has got one mineral. The per income of Botswana is US 6,500. The per capita income of Zimbabwe is US 1,200. But they have one mineral, we have 63. 63. And the difference is that Botswana has managed its one monomineral transparently. Its agreement with the De Beers group is transparent. Revenue flows from De Beers is transparent. We can't do that with our 63 minerals. And our accumulation model is faulty. If you take diamonds, Botswana, they've got a huge factory outside their air airport which cleans and polishes those diamonds at a greater cost than India. In India, in Botswana, polishing diamonds is 30 US dollars. In, in Botswana, in India, you can get away with $10. Same is in Israel. It's much more expensive, but the Botswana government forced the beers to say, we will process these uh, uh, diamonds here. So the problem in Zimbabwe is that, number one, we are selling these mines opaquely. We are selling mines without any due diligence. So Manize is given. We don't know who was given uh, and on what basis. Zimplats in Ingezi was given that resources. We don't know what price they paid. I saw, I was Minister of Finance, I saw the agreement. That agreement, if it had been subjected to parliament, no parliament would have, uh, uh, you, know, you, know, you, know, you, know, you know, passed that. We have just concluded Wange 7 and 8 on energy. I looked at the agreement, 1.5 billion uh, you know, you know, you know, dollars, something that could have cost us 800 million uh, uh, dollars. And our accumulation model is also false. Cecil John Rhodes died in 1907 or thereabouts. The accumulation model he left was that you deal and you export minerals in raw form. Investors, these investors are flocking to us. Chris was talking about uh, an expanded Forbes border post. He showed us a picture. They are building right now, as he said, they are deepening the port of Beira to to, to enable huge ships to actually come and collect this raw iron ore from uh, <laughs> from Maniz. So, if you were to work, if you were to wake up, if you were to wake uh, Chris, up, but we, you had, you level your time, Chris. You will have your if, time. If you will have your time. You will have your time. If you were to Let, work... Let's not rig the system. You will have your time. <laughs> uh, Trevor. Yes, please, stand I. If you were to wake up Cecil John Rhodes now, from his lofty grave at Matopo, he will not get lost in Zimbabwe's production cycle because the accumulation model, 120 years later, is still the same. It's still extraction, extraction, extraction. I take lithium. Lithium is now the black gold. A ton of lithium costs US $80,000. So it's the most valuable mineral, much more valuable than gold. But you've got trucks, huge trucks, that are exporting raw lithium through Forbes border post to, 
to, to Sofala, now known as Baira. How can we allow the raw exportation of lithium from places like Bikita when we could easily force them to build refineries that will process the lithium so that we can use it for mobile phones, for car batteries, and for the decarbonization of our country? Thank you. Take platinum. Mm. Last point. Okay. Platinum. Mm. Platinum is a dangerous uh, 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 metal because when you mine platinum, there are six other metals that come from it. Rhodium is one of them. Palladium is one of them. Now, because we don't have a refinery in Zimbabwe, what is accountable to us is a tiny fraction. They've been mining for 20 years. They've, we've failed to insist that a platinum refinery be built. We've even failed to force them to actually go and refine part of the platinum at Bindura nickel mine because there is a nickel refinery and nickel is also a, a, a metal. So we are failing this economy through opaqueness. We are failing this economy through failure to understand the value of what we are, we are dealing with. We are failing to develop this economy through failure to transform the accumulation model. And lastly, we're failing this economy through toxic, contested uh, politics. Thank you. You've made your, your point. Um, uh, um, Nigel, I'm sure you understand how important it is. Uh, Seguru, do you want to um, respond to the issues? There's a contestation here. Um, <laughs> Um, but you, you also raised important issues around, around talent, around competitiveness, which we have not dealt with. But do you want to engage in any of the issues that have been raised here? Sure, Trevor. And I, I, for the record, I want to uh, say, Kuna Minister Chris, when you point to the left and you say the party on the left, for the record, <laughs> I'm no politician. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, all right, yeah, just, just to make it clear. <laughs> Nanda Bacha needs to cross fire, so I want you to be very clear. I'm an investment banker, and an investment banker, Trevor, has got to be a bit classy. He's not going to stand up. He's going to sit down. And <laughs> but having said that, I think on a serious note, I want to really focus uh, with Minister Mutangwa. Minister, I implore you, I implore you, you sit in cabinet. I would implore you to, since two weeks ago, since two weeks ago congratulations by the way. I did see you and congratulate you uh, last week. Yes, congratulations. Yes. Now that you are in, in, in cabinet and knowing you, and I know you can speak truth to power, I would like you, I would like you to remind your boss, our president, of a conversation that we held in 1998 in Kadoma. And he represented the government of Zimbabwe. It was called the Kadoma Declaration. And he was part of the debates with labor, with bankers, with the private sector. And he and July Moyo represented the government of Zimbabwe. And we concluded jointly that the political risk premium for Zimbabwe was too high. And he conceded. He conceded at the time that it was too high. But he made one undertaking, and this is a, a very clear reminder. He made one undertaking. He said to us in that meeting, there is one thing that you youngsters can never do, which we can do, which is to deliver the land. Allow us to deliver the land, and then we will reduce that political risk premium. Now, as an investment banker, I still go back to say that premium, comparatively, is still far too high. 
Minister, I do business in the region. I am better off. Yes, I may be a small businessman <laughs> with a small balance sheet. But the capacity for me to do business in neighboring countries is a lot easier and cheaper financially than it is for me to do business here. And I would mother, much rather do business here. I would rather, you know, set the base here and compete from here. But the capacity to compete is just next to impossible. And we've got CEOs here. I'm sure Trevor's going to open up the conversation. Doing business here, where our infrastructure costs are very high, where our exchange rate is unstable and unpredictable, and we are competing when we are having triple digit or double digit inflation much, much higher than the single digit inflation that is experienced elsewhere renders us uncompetitive. So I really implore you that on the political risk premium, toxicity, yakawandisa, minister. I really say that from the bottom of my heart, whether these are political games, kanadzirids or politics, zacho, it's not working in terms of attracting international capital. I'm telling you, no. no. <laughs> this is the audience, because I want, I want to make a final point, Trevor. Because we cannot run any economy without developing our people as well. We cannot run any economy without developing our entrepreneurs as well, to give them a fighting chance to be able to access capital on the same terms as people in neighboring countries. Finally, Trevor, economic theory, coming back to economic development, there is what we call the trickle-down effect in terms of economic benefits that would accrue to the masses. And if our masses, if our CEOs do not have access to resources at competitive levels with either foreigners coming to invest here or to compete on the domestic market courtesy of trade barriers that are going to be coming down, then we are going to have a whole bunch of local entrepreneurs who are rendered non-competitive. And so that is my worry. Thank you. Uh, uh, Chris, as you respond to the issues that you have been raised, uh, I want you to please answer this question. Is it possible to attend to the issues, issues of toxicity? Is it possible to... Because, I, I, uh, colleagues, I hope, I hope you, do, you, you, you share my uh, sentiment. I would love to get out of this place with a sense that with these uh, three passionate conversations that we're having here, we can find each other and, and begin to say, do we agree there's toxicity? If there is, what do we do? Has there ever been any nation building in this country? If the answer is no, what do we do to build this nation? Because I'm hoping that we're just not wasting time exchanging words, but this, this is a step towards uh, finding each other. Can we, is there toxicity? Can, can we deal with it? And you deal with the questions that Tendai has raised. Trevor, just before minister comes through, the debt issue, which we are hamstrung with in terms of, of international, the debt we owe other nations, in terms of the re-engagement issue, I think it would be resolved if you did away with toxicity. Thank you. Uh, by the way, you are not under inquisition. <laughs> <Yes. so. laughs> Look, I am naturally a politician. I am trying as much as possible to be a businessman. <laughs> and trying to make you focus on business so that you make money in the new republic you are president Munangago. If you can decide, you make a choice. You follow what I'm listening from my left. You sh <laughs> we will see each other. We will see each other. 
Vamo washingo komblena. So varu kuita is good toxicity. 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 You will not make money by continuously looking through rare review mirror about the past. You will make money by seizing the opportunities which are being created now. The infrastructure which is required to make Manize jump from zero to 10 million tons of steel. Do you understand the scope of the infrastructure which is required? The railways, maybe 55,000 megawatts of electricity, maybe a new dam on the Munyati River. These are the issues which need your mind to be grappling with, to say, how do I find my space in a multi-billion dollar investment climate which is unfolding in this country? The billionaires who are coming here to put money in lithium, they need infrastructure. We need new ports in Baira. I have been negotiating the new ports in Baira and, Moz Moz and bring Zimbabwe and Mozambique together. I can't be told about uh, we are investment bankers, we are bringing one of Jaira to two, two, two million US dollars or 10 million US dollars. I can't be told we are investment bankers for these resources. We, we, we are any, an investment banker who goes to Shanghai or to Mumbai to bring 500 million US dollars to build a steel steel plant. That I can salute as an investment banker. Amus palev huyacho imi muripan. You understand? Amus, and what I am doing, what I am trying to, to, alert, to alert your minds to is that big money on a world class is coming into this country. You now need to marshal your resources to go and build those dams, to go and build those towns around Manize, to go and build, you see, who drove the road from here to, to, to Victoria Falls? It's finished. What is happening? Because trucks are carrying for coking coal from Wange all the way to Aselo Metal in South Africa, coking coal on a road. We need a new rail, the road to be revamped. There is enough capital to revamp the railway line in this country so that all that traffic goes off the road to the railway line. These are the opportunities which you should be talking about as investors with NASA, with the old Mutua, with everybody. I try to say, can we build a new town on Manize? Nobody responds. Then capital comes from outside, come and build a new capital, a new, t a new city at Manize. Because you are being to told toxicity. If there's toxicity, why are these business people coming and putting billions of dollars in this country? Why, where's your toxicity? You go there, you will change the toxicity. It's not affecting my billionaires. Elon Musk wants to come and put billions in Zimbabwe's lithium sector. He doesn't understand the word toxicity. He sees opportunity in lithium. What I'm trying to say is that the president has scaled the, the, the resource, the appeal of the resources of Zimbabwe to the best global capital in the world today. That's what the president has done. And it's, he's bringing it, this is, this is the capital which will lift this country out of poverty into development. When you have billionaires, you then can trickle up because we are getting big money coming into this country. But if you are being told the elections, you are being told the yeah, parliament, yeah, that is so, and you fix your mind on it as a businessman. And this is exactly the distinction between listening to me and what the president is offering and listening to BT trying to give you a course in politics as if it is a course in business. This is politics, I'm talking business, I think. <laughs> You, you said, and I'm quoting you, you said you are a politician who's trying to speak business. Um, <laughs> um, colleagues, I, I, could, could you share by indication of hands anybody who's got a, a question, a contribution uh, to make so that we include uh, more people? I've been told that we've got about 15 minutes. Um, whilst we're doing that, um, Tendai, and, and Nigel, I really want us to engage with the question, how do we lower the political temperature? How do we lower the toxicity? Because um, you, you, we, we do, you don't realize how where we are is not healthy until you realize that uh, toxicity can kill a democracy. And we need to attend to that. I know you will not agree, uh, business politician, but toxicity does kill um, 
uh, a democracy. Uh, are there people that want to engage with the conversation at all? Show sure, by raising hands. If not, uh, I know Zimbabwean CEOs can be a bit... Uh, no, I'm not going to go there. Let me give... Um, okay, you want to answer? Yeah, so let me... How do we detoxify Zimbabwe? Our country is torn in half. Whether you go by our own results or by the official results, the fact of the matter is that the country is torn in half. So this is a perfect scenario where dialogue is called for. We need dialogue. We need inclusiveness. We need tolerance. This dialogue must be inclusive. It must take everyone on board. It must take the church. It must take the trade unions. It must take the farmers. It must take a business. It must take capital on board. But we need dialogue. This dialogue must go beyond the sharing of, of, of cabinet seats. It must address the, que the national question. What does it mean to be Zimbabwe? What is the Zimbabwe that we are dreaming of? I dream of a Zimbabwe that is united, that is inclusive, a Zimbabwe that can uh, uh, grow a $200 billion GDP economy. I dream of a Zimbabwe where there is tolerance, where we, where we disarm, where we turn uh, these uh, uh, vicious... Uh, 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 cycles of exclusion into virtuous circles of inclusion. That's what we need to build. So dialogue is important. Dialogue uh, is, is, a, is, a, is, a, is a you know is a starting point. Number two, let's respect the institutions, the constitution. We've amended it. Even the new constitution, we've amended it in over forty amendments in the last two years. A constitution should be sacred. A constitution should be rules of engagement respected by all on whatever side of power uh, that you are you are in our institution our, our institutions are important the judiciary the press uh, all these things are, are you know are, are you know are important elections deliver systems that deliver citizens that are empowered we've created in the constitution a fourth arm of the state the anti corruption commission the human rights commission the gender commission the national peace and reconciliation commission this must have teeth this must have oversight uh, over the state oversight over over government so to uh, parliament so the starting point is dialogue the end point is dialogue and inclusion How do we lower, uh, Tendai has made his contribution, how do we lower the political temperature, toxicity? Um, Tendai is pushing dialogue strongly, uh, an inclusive kind of uh, dialogue. And, and, and Chris, as you sit there, I would want you to uh, reflect on this. Is it possible to build this nation, nation building that is inclusive so that everybody feels uh, involved? Uh, Nigel? You know, Trevor, from an investment perspective, uh, uh, again, I want to emphasize, yes, my little two million may be a small balance sheet, but it's worth a whole lot to me. That having been said, I think as Zimbabweans, because we are competing for international capital, and yes, Minister Mchwango, yes, we, we, we compliment you for what you've brought. We're not denying that. You were together with milk. <laughs> Isn't that so? Zim Cyber City. Uh, that's another one uh, that I thought you would mention. So we see it. But we're saying how much more could be coming to Zimbabwe? That is the question for me. And from my perspective, my humble perspective, the people that I engage with, the people that could potentially bring money, say very distinctly, are your politicians tone deaf? Do they listen to themselves? In other words, you know, the optics don't look good from the outside looking in. They don't. They cannot look good just to those who have access to Minister Chris 
And if Minister Chris did a, a sterling job in bringing the investors, we are saying, how much more can we all do as CEOs here to bring counterparts? minister. a billionaire. billion. But I'm saying it's not possible under the optics that are seen. And are we tone deaf? Is it impossible for Zimbabweans to sit across the desk and remove this albatross of this debt area around us? We are bankers, Namkomanik. Can we access lines of credit? Hell no. The friends are still there in the banking system. It's too hot in the engine room. Are we together? So I'm saying, yes, what you've done is commendable. But we are asking for more. We are saying, guys, but Moita ma billionaire me gaere ne ma forena aiwa nyika ino vakwa nani andi ndi muri zvitaura kuti na hanzi nyika ino vakwa nani saka isu satisi venere what are we saying and and by the way by the way they fought the war but we are not interested in fighting a war no we want to no, fight the we the, want to to fight the war of poverty exactly. and economic development and growth we are talking war now. We are not interested in that. We want to get rich also. <laughs> to it, I'm a billionaires. But, but uh, Chris, jokes aside, the point that uh, Nigel is raising for me is hugely important. What you do, we are not denying. But we are we're asking certain questions. Wakaita nani, kupi, munani, muchite, and that kind of stuff. We wanting, <laughs> we wanting, we wanting transparency. So, so we're not. We're, we're, we're saying we're not saying it's bad what you've done. But to ten, to uh, Nigel's point. If what you did, all of us here could do, imagine what would happen to this country. Can we also be included? Or better still, what do we do for us to be included? I would rather uh, answer the last one. Uh, what can we do to be included? I've mentioned it. The president has opened the country's resources to the best possible capital in the world today. They are bringing their money into this country because they are the only ones who can provide, one, the capital, two, the technology, three, the markets, and thirdly, the products to satisfy those markets. I keep, I don't want to continue to dwell on Tsing Shan, but I told you, when Tsing Shan comes and puts a plant of steel in your country, and they are number one in the world, Toyota follows, Mercedes-Benz, follows. Nissan follows. This is investment on a world-class scale where Zimbabwe will position itself to produce powertrains of the new electric vehicles from Zimbabwe because the guy who has come here to do steel is the best one. I am trying to impress upon you that these are the investments which open up opportunities to a country to move forward. You are trying to see yourself as a competitor to Tsingshan. Then if you make that mistake, then you will not position yourself accordingly. Because he has already attained that level in the global marketplace. He is giving an opportunity to this country. I will cite a very specific example, which I spent the last six to seven, eight months to, talking to a particular bank in this country to raise 60 million to build a power station, a power line from Sherwood to Manise. There are bankers here. There is no more than $60 billion, of, $60 billion in the market of Zimbabwe. They can't supply that money. They say to the company, we want a balance sheet from Shanghai. The guy says, I've built a, 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 a $150 million furnace in Selu. I've put $400 million in furnaces, I mean, in coke batteries in Wange. And I'm building, I've put $600 million, $800 million in a steel plant in Manise. I am going to create all this output, which would command that, to consume that electricity. And then you still want me to bring a balance, a, 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 my balance sheet from Shanghai. I'm a $60 billion company. Then 
Our banks can't buy it. Two days ago, Ned Bank comes from South Africa, says, oh, is this what happens in this country? Here's the money. You understand? You are seeing opportunities in your country, but because you are being told it's a toxic environment, you can't open your eyes to these vistas. We need to build a dam at Munyati River to supply the steel plant. We may end up having somebody from outside the region come and build that plant because you are seeing toxicity in, your, in, in opportunities which are stuck. If a, a man who is investing two to thirty billion in dollars in your country doesn't see toxicity, why do you always want to see toxicity yourself in your own country? I, get, I cite another example. I'm just, Varun, they spent here years trying to get into Zimbabwean market. They couldn't. Then eventually President Mnangagwa comes in. Varun is given opportunities. Within 24 months, they've built eight production lines. A traditional bottling company which was in this country, which used to sell Coca-Cola can for $1.80, now has to face somebody who supplies cans at 30 cents, 38 cents per company. Do you know what the Varun man from India says? He says, if the money which is available, disposable income in Zimbabwe, was the, this per capita was the same in India, I would be building eight plants every month in India. He is seeing an opportunity. He is we are seeing toxicity. Now, you see, these are the issues which I'm, I, I, when I make this, made these investments, I did not make them as a minister. How many times have I been? How many times? I went to a minister from Gabi in cabinet. I didn't last a year. I've, I've just been back now with two weeks as a minister. Don't try to see me as somebody who is in government bring in, as a minister bringing investments. No, I think and act as a businessman. I am from the money school in New York. I'm a banker by training from school. I lived in Brussels, which is the biggest trading center for goods in the world. That's why I started my diplomatic life. I am the founder of the digital economy in Zimbabwe and Telecom. That's my other degree. What I'm talking about is I've seen goods and services being traded on the global scale from Brussels. I've seen money from New York being used, being, being, being made to drive the world market. I went to China where I saw a medieval country being transformed by foreign direct investment in the shortest period of time. I saw miracles in China. They are more than us. We are less. We have more resources. We can do it. The main thing is if you dwell on toxicity in our minds, and then you are a businessman, you are told toxic, you will sit on your haunches and then do, do, do no, nothing. Don't listen to this message about toxicity. <laughs> See opportunities and we move forward as a country. I thank you. Thank you, Chris. <clears throat> um, they, they, okay, um, my brother Nick has a question. Nick, please, if you could proceed. Um, I'll ask you, you gentlemen, starting with uh, Nigel, for your closing marks. Uh, brief two minutes, uh, minute rather. Yes, uh, my brother. Am I audible? Okay. Um, I think it's a very interesting debate. But my point is just to say it's a bit... Uh, sad to hear about the Varuns and all those other people. Um, I think when the president says it's a very serious statement. Um, in 2015 uh, the government said we are in 2023 despite um, a cabinet directive I still don't have my farms uh, my institutions are not fully back But if Varun comes into Zimbabwe and has everything that he wants in a month or two, and in seven years, I can have what I want, it goes back to what my brother Nigel is saying. And this is when why we are there. Those are the issues. 
I think we, we want to go practical so that um, we can truly build our country. The Second Republic is opening up for us. And in my thinking, it's not about Vana Varuni, it's about us first. Um, I was chairman of CBZ. Government put me there when CBZ was insolvent. Um, and in 18 months, I managed to bring the IFC. They actually didn't do a due diligence for their investment in CBZ. The IFC had invested in a project, a banking institution that I went to set up in Nigeria. They made their money through what I did in nine months. When they came to CBZ, they simply said, we've worked with this man, we are investing in CBZ, only on condition that he remains chairman. In other words, they were looking at uh, credibility. I'm the one who brought ABSA. It was not Dr. Gono, it was me who brought ABSA into the country. ABSA invested in CBZ. That's how we turned around CBZ. That capital was coming through private hands. And I think that's what uh, Nigel is saying. We have the capacity. We may not have a billion sitting on the balance sheet, but we have that capacity, that credibility that will attract money into Zimbabwe without us having to run around. That's my point. Chris, is that your pay grade or uh, it is? Okay. Yeah, I understand completely what Dr. and we are very close. Yeah. Maybe it's because I'm, uh, I'm in cabinet now, he thinks I also should try to bring it up, which I will, about this particular issue. But this is a peculiar issue, uh, and I don't want to cloud, to cloud the discussions which we'll be having here. My main point, my main point, and I want to repeat, the president is bringing world-class capital, which is commensurate to the resources of Zimbabwe. Secondly, we have educated the best population in Africa, in Zimbabwe. And I know because I'm a war veteran, this is a product of the war veterans' education in Zimbabwe. No country, which an African country, which has relied on the budget, JNEP, to try to provide universal education and succeeded. In Zimbabwe, we took the organization from the war, people's war. We made people build schools for free because the budget in parliament from Chizero at that particular time was said, it's too small, we are coming from the war. And we said, we've promised people education during the war, we can't lie. Then we said to Chizero, take the little money which you have, give the teachers, we build schools for free. There was a competition between the parents building schools, competing each against each other in villages to get a teacher from Harare. Harare could not provide enough teachers. We went back to Havana as war veterans, asked Fidel Castro to convert our former military camps into teacher training camps. We trained 6,000 teachers in Havana to come and close the gap between parents building schools and government providing teachers. That's why we have a high human resource index in Zimbabwe. And the template of Zimbabwe's capacity in AI in education is reflected by the performance of the Zimbabwean in the diaspora who has gone there. They are all a super achievers, regardless of which jurisdiction they are working in, in the countries, from Dubai to Australia to whatever. So this is a human resource index which can deliver miracles. What does it need? It needs capital, which also is commensurate to their resources at home. And that's what President Mnangagwa has closed as a gap. 
to get world-class capital which can make Zimbabweans produce world-class goods made in Zimbabwe for the global market. We have also provided stability. We are being told about toxicity. This is at a superficial level in terms of politics. What you need to understand is Zimbabwe being the only African country which took on the most powerful imperial army of the West in terms of uh, colonialism in Africa and won that war. We built an organizational capacity in Africa which is second to none. We are the most structured society in Africa, period, because you don't win a war against Britain unless you are structured. So we have a very solid state system in Zimbabwe. That's why we can withstand sanctions for many years. But if you want to dwell on the superficiality of toxicity, that's another level. When it is, you look at the core, we are very strong. And that's why capital of that nature of global billionaires comes to Zimbabwe because they know we are a stable state. You got to look at the positives which we have as a country and start building upon them. But if you continue to daydream about toxicity and why elections are this and why somebody is going to parliament and that, you miss the picture from the, the, you mix the wood from the trees. I'm appealing to you, President Mnangagwa is giving tremendous opportunities to this country. Open up and we take advantage of them and you can then discharge the role which you are doing because you are appreciating what is being done. But if you are negative about what is, and you don't want to know what's Manise, what's happening at Sabi Sabi, what's happening at Wange, what's happening at Mapinge, where we're going to build a world-class battery city from the company which manufactures the fastest trains in the whole world, in China. They are building a new city at Mapinge in my home area in Marsh, Marsh West. If you, if you are oblivious to those opportunities, don't expect to become a billionaire. I thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Nick, your, your issue pains me. It breaks my heart. And I think the contrast that you, you draw is so clear, so uh, thing. Um, it, it pains me. I don't understand the, the history behind it, uh, but uh, my brother has promised he'll raise it in cabinet now that he's there. Um, it, it pains me. It really pains me. Um, Nigel, uh, two minutes, uh, not two minutes really, a minute to close. We are standing in between lunch and uh, these people, eh? and uh, a flight back to Harare. Absolutely, and I'm going to be on, on that flight. Quick points. For me, low-hanging fruit. Number one, I implore and petition that uh, the Kadoma Declaration, in terms of the context, I understood it with the president uh, in 1998, be put on the table uh, so that we address that. Uh, I think it then triggers the second point in terms of inclusivity. We want to be that uh, fast-growing nation. We computed, we can't make it in terms of GDP growth if we don't actually put Zim on, on, on steroids in a manner that actually trickles down to include all of us. And that money is there. That money can definitely follow what Minister Mchangwa has said. If billions are coming, then more billions can come. And we want to be part of that game. We really want to. And I think there is commitment on the part of the private sector to give us a fighting chance to be able to compete fairly and squarely with those guys who are coming here. Ultimately, when dividends are paid by these foreign guys, that money actually moves out. And again, you've got an, a balance of payments problem that could emanate in years to come. We need to build a savings base here. We need to make Zimbabwe acceptable in the international global capital markets. Thank you for the opportunity. Your close, closing uh, minute remark, Tendai. Well, thank you, thank you. I, I think that, um, Chris, you can't run away from the elephant in the living room, which is that we've got a political crisis, uh, which is that, um, which is that uh, our country is arrested and detained by this uh, uh, toxic discourse uh, of um, violent uh, politics of disunity and intolerance. So we need to, 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 uh, to fix that. We need to fix that to create a soft landing uh, for our country. This is a country that has seen a coup. We don't want to see another, another coup. So dialogue is important. 
Dialogue is important. Dialogue is important. Second thing, it's, it's not enough to say we are bringing in the Chinese or your favorite company, Tsi Tsang Tsung, in, um, <laughs> in, in, in Manize. We, we have a government that has been very unkind to black capital, to local black capital. We have, in fact, failed to produce black capitalists in this country. We have failed to produce black bourgeois in this country because of a government that has been very paranoid of black capital. Vingirai over there is a good example. My friend Nigel Chanakira is a good example. Uh, uh, you're going to speak last. Uh, uh, Farai Rodzi, Shingi we have all failed to, 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 to produce black capital. The richest black men in Zimbabwe can't even stay in Zimbabwe because we are paranoid of, of black capital. We failed to produce black capital. You went to the war of liberation. You, you know what I'm going to talk about, the National Democratic Revolution. We failed to embark on a, on a National Democratic Revolution. And a National Democratic Revolution in Marxist terms is basically creating capital, black capital, the real construction of VNA. We are happy with Varun. We are happy with Tsing Tsung Tsung, but we are not happy with Vingirai. We are not happy with Chanakira. We are not happy with Trevor Ngube. We are not happy with Farai Rodzi. That is not good enough. We are not happy with the citizen. That is not good enough. Thank you. You, you, you. I, I think you have spoken and closed and opened and closed. Do you still want to talk? <laughs> very briefly, eh? Very, very briefly. 2000 and 2004, land reform has hit the agricultural sector. The new landowners have no money completely to the farm, the farms which they have been given. We organize the biggest company in the whole world doing tobacco. China tobacco is the largest, and the Chinese consume more cigarettes than any other country on earth. They come here, they start working with rural people who are the new owners of the land. Today, that industry is 800 million US dollars per year. And for it, many years, the money which all you bankers were talking about, could circulate, is being earned by those peasant farmers who are now 200,000 of them registered with TIMP. Now you're coming to tell me that you are against the black bourgeoisie. That's also a black bourgeoisie in terms of, of of, 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 of economics. You've got to give credit where it is given. And that's what saved land reform. Another quick example. I gave you the cited gold. Six years ago, it was illegal for young people to dig gold in this country. Gondo Tumiwa in a new tunic, new shirts, new helmets, new truncheons. gold the vice president was in cabinet. I went into that cabinet. I said, we can't do that. This is the tradition of Zimbabwe for 800 years of digging gold. Today, those young people are producing $2 billion worth of gold, which is supporting the currency Yenu today. And you are telling me that that kind of company is averse to creating a black middle, a middle class. Can I meet? Musande kushora opportunity to any government because young people are making and digging gold. All we now need is to upgrade them and make them, give them the capital to go to the next level. These are opportunities which are very practical. Not Thank you.